Listener supported. WNYC Studios. Hi, Ira here. Wondering if you've ever thought about what goes into making our radio show. It's something I think about every single day. Financially speaking, it's a lot. It costs us tens of thousands of dollars each week to make Science Friday. And fees from stations, well, they account for less than 30% of our budget. That's where you come in. Donations help support these costs, both big and small. A donation from you in any amount allows us to provide the high-quality science news and conversations that you depend on. You can make a donation by going to sciencefriday.com slash give. Your gift helps ensure the conversation continues. That's sciencefriday.com slash give. And thanks. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Later in the hour, we'll be asking you, did you just eat that? Stick with me. You're going to want to hear this. But first, we all know that plastics in the environment are a big problem. And recently came word that an effort to clean up some of the plastics in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is not going as well as planned. In Europe, though, there are moves to tackle the problem closer to the source. The EU is finalizing rules for a ban on many single-use plastic items. Rachel Feltman, science editor at Popular Science, is here to fill us in on that and other selected short subjects in science. Welcome back, Rachel. Thanks for having me, Ira. Okay, so why is the EU rule a a big deal? Yeah, well, it's a big deal because uh, obviously there's been a lot of talk on single-use plastic bans. It's an obvious place to start when we talk about dealing with plastic pollution. It goes without saying that something that's used once or twice before being thrown away is a bigger problem than a plastic item you bring into your house to use for a year, five years, whatever. Uh, So this is would be the biggest uh, region that Mm -hmm. would undertake something like this. Uh, And it kind of uh, begs the question of why North America isn't uh, doing something similar. You know, I think in the U.S. we may start to see states uh, banning single-use plastics, but we're really really just starting to see plastic bag bans, straw bans. So for the EU to take such a uh, broad stance, uh, banning, I think it's 10 different items, um, plastic cutlery, plates, straws, styrofoam takeout containers and cups, uh, Q-tip sticks, and oxo-degradable uh, plastics, which includes most plastic bags. Um, for them to take such a, a big stance is, is a big deal. Mm-hmm. I know one of the hot gifts this holiday season are metal straws you can buy people in a right. nice pack. Yeah. Yeah. There are lots of lots of options for reusable straws. It's a, yeah. it's a good place to start if you can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's move on to a story from the National Zoo that sounds like something out of uh, Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, so people were really excited that the National Zoo uh, had... Um, a few weeks ago, they had announced that there was a, a power vacuum in their naked mole rat colony. Oh, no. <laughs> and, <laughs> and a few days ago, they announced that a queen had emerged from a bloody and long fought uh, struggle. But really? <laughs> Which is, I think, you know, people love the juxtaposition of like royalty and naked mole rats because, frankly, naked mole rats are really ugly. Yeah. Um, they're very squirmy and, and pale and uh, pretty much blind. And uh, the idea of them having a queen is just kind of inherently funny. But how, how do you have a <laughs> battle over this? Well, that's what I love about this is that once you look more into the story, it becomes really fascinating. Um, so naked mole rats are eusocial, which is uh, the same kind of social structure that uh, ants and bees have. It's like that hive collective where there's only really one like independently operating member of the colony and everyone else is just functioning uh, for the common good. And in fact, there's just that one reproductive member of the colony, the queen. Um, And in... uh there are only actually two mammals, by the way, that are eusocial, and they're both kinds of mole rats, naked mole rats being one of them. So they have this really unique social structure, and it means that uh, whenever a queen dies, um, the biggest females will start fighting with each other, and whichever one lives long enough to get pregnant and reproduce uh, then becomes the queen. And once there's a queen in place, something really interesting happens. Uh, no other females uh, are fertile, but more like specifically, they don't have um, mature sex organs. Right. Like it seems like the queen is able to shut down puberty. And in fact, any males she doesn't want to reproduce with also don't go through puberty. And that process starts up again as soon as the queen is gone. So it's just very weird and cool. I see you're not interested in this at all. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, as we all know, the the holidays are upon us, and there's some news about uh, holidays and your health. Yeah, so this uh, study came out uh, claiming that Christmas Eve is the deadliest cardiovascular day of the year. Um, and there are some caveats. The study only looked at Sweden. Uh, so it is the day for the biggest day for heart attacks uh, in Sweden. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, we can't apply that to the rest of the world. However, there is a lot of research already uh, that shows that heart attacks are more common uh, on holidays. And there's already research showing that if you live in a predominantly Christian country, that Christmas is probably the deadliest day of all, which just is scientific proof that we're all actually horribly stressed out <laughs> when we're surrounded by our family. <laughs> Not to mention depressed. We've yeah. seen it for years. We've heard about depressions going up. Right. I mean, yeah. it's it's a joyful time, but it's also a very stressful time. And people are also eating strange foods and traveling. And it's just a, kind of a perfect storm if you're already at risk of a heart attack. Hmm. Uh, this is a new there. Yeah, you know, so this is unbelievable to add something else. To, to be yeah. stressed about stressing about. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, but one related thing is that there was another study showing that people who are discharged from hospitals during the yeah. holiday season are more likely to die afterward just because they tend to not follow up on um, on their care. So one thing you can do is that if you're unfortunate enough to end up in the hospital, you know, make that follow-up appointment and follow the instructions. Don't feel like you're being a buzzkill because you're, you're dealing with your, your health. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it can be prevented by just advocating for yourself and taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And finally, there is a distant space object far, <laughs> far away. Yes. In fact, scientists have named it Far Out. Is that right? <laughs> yes. That, that's the official name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I far think, Out? Yeah. Somebody um, from the 60s named it that, I'm <laughs> sure. Uh, but it's about 120 to 130 AU away, um, an AU astronomical unit being the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, and Pluto is only 34 AU away. So this thing is really far out. In That's fact. far out man, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing I love about it is that uh, the most distant objects that we consider part of the solar system are actually like tens of thousands of AUs out. Right. So this is just a reminder of how much space there is in just our solar system um, and how much room there is for perhaps a planet nine to be hiding. So this this is something maybe the size of Pluto or something smaller? Or? Yeah, you know, they're, it's still too soon. Uh, they're saying maybe it's a dwarf planet, but it's yeah. they don't have enough data to tell. But it's definitely like a large asteroid at the very least. Far out, <laughs> All right, Rachel, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Something Ira. I love. Rachel Feltman, science editor at Popular Science. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Ira. And now it's time to check in on the state of science. This is KER for WWNO, St. Louis Public Radio, KKMD Iowa News. Public Radio News. Local science stories of national significance. Okay, picture this. It's flu season is coming, so you decide to drive the whole family over to the local pharmacy to get vaccinated, right? And But when you get there, your teenager is denied the shot. Why is that? Well, the rules for vaccinations differ from state to state. And in some states, there's an age cutoff for getting a pharmacy vaccination. Joining me to talk about that is Alex Olgan, health reporter at WFAE in Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks, Sarah. So why can't everybody get a flu shot at the same place? Because of state laws, like you said, each state has different rules about what, pharma what vaccines pharmacists can give, if they can give vaccines at all. Like in North Carolina, they even list out which five vaccines other than the flu shot pharmacists can give. And then they have this like special exception and special age limit for the flu shot. Um, and, you know, the expert I talked to has been studying this and said since the 1990s, you know, states across the country have been expanding pharmacists uh, vaccine authority. So what is the age limit in North Carolina for the flu shot? So for the flu shot, you have to be 14 or older. And that was relatively recently changed. If you remember back to 2009, the swine flu mm. uh, pandemic, I actually got swine flu, although I was not living in North Carolina. Um, so the, the state medical board said, we need to grant some emergency authority and let pharmacists uh, give these flu vaccines to people as young as 14. Mm. And then in 2013, the state um, lawmakers said, all right, let's, let's codify this. And they put it into state law. So how many other states have these kinds of rules? 
so all across the board and they they vary so some states say well pharmacists can give vaccine but then you also have to have um, a, like a prior authorization from a doctor or primary care physician or um, they can give uh, the flu shot but they can't give other vaccines so it's really all over the map um, so I you know mm -hmm. last we checked in 26 states in DC pharmacists can give vaccines to people at any age but like I said there's all kinds of different limits mm -hmm. so you, you have varying limits uh um, Three-year-olds can get them in some states, but not in yeah. other states. Yeah, Arizona allows people as young as three to get vaccines at the pharmacy. You know, it's kind of a public health question, right? If you want lots of people to get vaccinated, should we make it easier for them to get vaccinated? A.K.A., like you said, take the whole family to the pharmacy and get it all done at once. Mm -hmm. can, can other, you know, I, I heard a story that a doctor, a dentist can give the vaccine too. Yeah, so I asked the American Dental Association about this, and they said that in Illinois and Minnesota, um, those states are now allowing dentists to give the flu vaccine to adult patients. Again, there's that age limit. you got to be 18 right. or older. I think some of the public health theory behind this is, you know, if someone is coming to the dentist every six months, but they're not going to their primary care doctor, let's just get it to them while we can. And let's not forget the economic side of things, because, you know, with the ACA, uh, as it is, I guess, before it was declared unconstitutional, um, pre all preventive care is covered, and so you have to, insurance companies have to pay for the flu vaccine, so whoever gives the vaccine can get reimbursed. You know, that makes a lot of sense, because if you think about it, people do go to the dentist for cleaning or something much more than they probably go to the doctor. People wait five, ten years to go to the doctor sometimes. Right. Um, and, and so do you think that states are going to basically change their rules about the vaccination and, and when they can they allow teenagers to be vaccinated? So it's funny you mentioned that. I just looked it up, and uh, earlier this week, New Jersey uh, signed, the governor there signed a law expanding vaccination authority to pharmacist interns. Of course, they have to be supervised by a fully licensed pharmacist, but that was, to my knowledge, the most recent expansion. Um, I know there has been some murmurs around the state you know, that pharmacists right. are not thrilled that there are these age limits. But, you know, the the, um, the the state law here actually says that if someone goes to get a vaccine, the pharmacists are supposed to tell their prim primary care doctor. And if the patient says, well, I don't have a primary care doctor, then the pharmacist is supposed to tell the patient about the benefits of having a primary care doctor written by some of the doctor's associations in North Carolina. Well, if you're 13... You know, try to tell a teenager. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Alex. You're welcome. Have a happy holiday. You too. Alex Olgin is health reporter at uh, WFAE in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, when we come back, we're going to take a break. And then we're going to take on some of those food safety questions. You know, just in time for the office holiday party. Is it safe to double dip in the cheese dip? What about, you know, spreading germs on all kinds of stuff? We have a couple of expert biologists who are going to talk about this. We'll even play a little classic piece from Seinfeld with George in it. You're gonna you're gonna love this this segment. Stay with us, be right back after this break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. If you're a Seinfeld fan, perhaps you remember this classic moment. George is at a party, just like the kind you're gonna be attending this holiday season. People are schmoozing, eating the crudite. Then he's caught double dipping his cracker into the dip. Double dipped? What what, what are you talking about? You dipped the chip, you took a bite, and you dipped again. <laughs> so? That's like putting your whole mouth right in the dip. Well, does double dipping a chip really infect the dip? What about the five-second rule where you drop some food onto the floor? Is it too germy to eat? And how about this holiday favorite? Does spiking the eggnog kill the bacteria, you know, the alcohol in it. My next guests are two biologists who investigated these food questions we've all thought about. In their new book, Did You Just Eat That? Two scientists explored double dipping, the five-second rule, and other food myths in the lab. So if you've got questions about the bacteria and germs around us this season, like when you blow out the candles, do you spread your germs all over the cake? Hmm. 
These two guys are here for you. Do you have a food or germ myth you're wondering about? Our number is 844-724-8255, 844-724-8255, or you can tweet us at SciFry. Let me introduce my guest. Paul Dawson is professor of food science at Clemson University in Clemson, South Carolina. Brian Sheldon is professor emeritus of food microbiology and poultry science at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you, Ira. Glad Thank to be you, here. Thank you, Ira. My pleasure. Paul, you actually teach a class about these questions we all think about, like the five-second rule and double dipping? In a sense, yeah. We have a program called Creative Inquiry here at Clemson. And the reason, the purpose of the class is to expose students to research. So rather than, or in addition to going to a lab, if we have all remember our labs back when we were in high school and college where you kind of receive a, a list of things, an order of things to do, in these classes, the students come and they address a problem or an issue, uh, everyday issue, and they get, get some choice in that. And we attack that in the lab, so to speak, with a scientific method. And as you mentioned, some of these in the intro, these are the ones we've uh, used to uh, use, teach the students how to do research. Mm -hmm. Let me go right into that clip from uh, George Costanza, double dipping. Well, let me ask right out, is that a dangerous thing to do? Well, I guess dangerous is uh, how you approach it, but the fact of the matter is we did find that you do transfer oral bacteria to the dip. So if the uh, people in the room are your good friends and you feel comfortable exchanging uh, saliva with them, if you will, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, it's not a problem. But the, as you know, this time of year in particular, uh, we're concerned about the cold, flu, and uh, mm -hmm. influenza, and the common cold, and so forth. So, I guess there is some risk uh, in mm -hmm. doing that. Brian, I, I was going to ask, what are the most common bacteria and viruses that like to munch on our food? Well, that's quite a, a variety. There's, you know, there's thousands, literally, uh, millions of organisms that comprise uh, our bodies itself. It's been estimated somewhere like five times ten to thirtieth. Uh, organisms on this planet, and about 39 uh, trillion actually reside in or on our bodies. And fortunately, about 99% of those uh, are seemingly harmless or actually have beneficial uh, uses for us. Only about 1% of the of the known bacteria and viruses actually are pathogenic or disease-causing. So uh, relative to, I mean, these organisms, just like us, they need to metabolize, they need a nutrient source, and mm -hmm. uh, they carry on all the functions that we do. They reproduce, they communicate, they, they are able to move. And uh, so consequently, they're going to be in about every environment that we're in, and uh, we can't do uh, can't do do anything without them because mm -hmm. they are part of us. And it's just a matter of that is that that one percent of the organisms that uh, did that land in that dip, uh, like Paul said. Uh, Essentially, you know, is there a, a cold virus or a flu virus uh, or you know pneumonia right. uh, virus or bacteria in that. Uh, you know, in that dip or anything that we touch, too, and it could could contain these organisms. So it's a matter, it, it, really, you're playing the odds. There's always a risk associated with anything we right. do in life. It's a matter, of, you know, how great is that risk? And, of course, the risk for us also depends upon, you know, our immune systems themselves. Uh, you know, if there were very aged or very young or immunocompromised in some way, obviously we're going to be at greater risk uh, if, in engaging in these types of practices like double dipping and uh, mm -hmm. uh, just everyday life. Let me let me hone in on a few things that people do or pe people uh, think about. Is there, uh, uh, is there a time, a set limit of time that you can allow the food to stay on outside on the serving tables before they go bad, or does each food have its own clock on it? This is Brian again. Brian? I'll, uh, Go ahead. I'll jump in on that one, and Paul can follow with uh, additional information if he cares to. Well, the recommendation is that uh, the food not stand on the on the countertop or the picnic table for more than two hours. <laughs> That's dependent upon what the atmospheric conditions are, the environment. You know, if you're out there in that proverbial summer picnic and it's 90 plus degrees and you have a, let's just say a meat containing product, a chicken containing product, it's sitting out there at 90 degrees. 
we did some uh, some calculations. If you had like 40 salmonella cells per gram of material after four hours, you would have something like 2.6 million oh. cells. So, but we're, in, so we're not, inside in the holiday season, inside someone's living room or <laughs> kitchen or something. How? I, the, st- the recommendation is still to still be two within hours. two two hours. Uh, and some, they actually, if the conditions are, are too favorable for growth of the organism, within 30 minutes, you ought to be refrigerating it. Hmm. Wow. Um, <laughs> do you want to add anything to that? You well, I, yeah, I guess, you know, obviously, we're talking about uh, casseroles and food that right. are perishable. And you left an M&M out on the table, you know, it's not going to be a problem. There are different, some foods are very shelf, what we call shelf stable. So, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, we are considering the, mm. uh, the cash rolls, like Brian mentioned. Let me go to the, we have a lot of people calling in. Let's go to uh, the phones early. Josiah in Harrisburg, South Dakota. Hi, Josiah. Hello. Hey there. Okay, so my question was is it bad if you take the, like, if you're cooking some food and then you take it out and give it a taste and then put the utensils back in? Is that bad? Mmm, good question. <laughs> so, uh, you're, you're tasting with a spoon, is that a bad thing? Because it's going back into the sauce or whatever you're making. Yeah, that's actually uh, kind of one of the chapters. We did a study on uh, sharing food, if you will. And we actually, because in, we talk about in some cultures it's common, and even our culture, we, you know, we share food or actually taste food, as, as I was mentioned by the caller. Uh, so, you, you know, again, if we go back to the double dipping, it, you are transferring oral bacteria to the food when you do that. Uh, so, yeah. again, if you're going to keep, if you're gonna, <laughs> Brian can jump in again after I finish, but uh, if you're continuing to cook the food, uh, that but, may but take care of that. Doesn't it get destroyed by the heat? I mean, if it's, you're boiling soup or something, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, it if, just... you, if you continue to cook it and, yes. and cook it after, but if it's like the last... Yeah the last few minutes of the cooking or or whatever you're, you're probably not going to because because i mentioned it's a time and temperature both uh growth wise and destruction wise for bacteria and viruses it's, it's a time and temperature combination so you know 10 seconds at a particular temperature is not the same thing as a minute or 10 minutes or whatever so mm-hmm. uh, uh tasting is not bad if you're going to cook it fully after that <laughs> You know, you, that's why you see sh- professional chefs, when they want to taste something, they take a piece of bread and dip it in, and then, and then they taste it. They don't actually take the spoon or something. That, that's probably a good practice. <laughs> um, well, at least we hope they do that. <laughs> <laughs> let's, okay, Paul, let's talk about the, the everyone has heard of the five-second rule, right? You, you can eat something off the floor as long as you pick it up within five seconds, and you actually tested that out. There's a history to this idea, right? Where did it come from? Yeah, we did. That was uh, also a fun part of the book. In most chapters, we go back and uh, we talk about food habits or practices and like, you know, blowing out birthday candles or the five second rule. We're trying to figure out where it started. And really, we couldn't find it. I don't think there is a definitive origin of the five second rule, but there are some writings in history. Actually, Genghis Khan made some statements uh, about if food was left, it was if food was prepared for Genghis Khan then it was good enough to eat no matter how long it stayed on the floor. So he had the con rule. And then uh, really there's a video or a tape of uh, Julia Child dropping a potato pancake on the stovetop and making a comment, uh, it's fine to put it back on the plate if nobody's in the kitchen, did you? <laughs> so, uh, so that may have been the origin of that. But uh, we actually, uh, there's kind of two questions there, and that's kind of a part of the learning of the creative inquiry studies we did. Uh, you asked the question, is it safe to eat if you pick it up in five seconds? Uh, whereas we really tested, is back to your transfer if you pick it up within mm. five seconds? And those are, can be two different things because it depends on really what surface you drop it on. So we really, in our study, again, and again, the part of the uh, nice thing is uh, I learned a lot and the students learn how to go about and create uh, an experiment. So we went to a local home supply store and bought small, like four or five inch square pieces of carpet, tile, and wood flooring. Uh, took them back to the lab, sterilized them, chelated them with salmonella, and then actually left the, did two things, left the salmonella on those surfaces for uh, different periods of time before dropping food, uh, bologna in our case, and, and white bread, and then picking it up within five seconds, 30 seconds, or 60 seconds, and then measuring the transfer of bacteria to that food. Uh, and again, probably not surprising to the mo- to most people is it was transferred 
within five seconds instantaneously essentially so if there's contaminated mm. if the surface is contaminated uh the five second rule is a myth yeah there you go let's go to the phones to jimmy in inglewood uh, new jersey hi jimmy how you doing great show great topic so just to piggyback on uh that that transfer rule say if i had a slice of pizza in the kitchen and I drop this face down on the floor, the cheese, and then I pick it up and run some, you know, cold or hot water, you know, over it. And again, uh, you know, just piggybacking on that, yeah. what would happen? Yeah. Can, can, you, can you rinse stuff off that's dropped on the floor? Well, I, I think uh, yeah, obviously you're going to have some impact. You're going to be able to rinse some of the, the organisms off, but be able to get a totally, uh, let's just say, use the word sterile uh, product by just simply rinsing, you're not going to be able to achieve that. And then it comes down to the question of, you know, what was on that floor to begin with. Uh, it very well could not be any pathogenic organisms, but then again, there could be. If you mm -hmm. have a dog that, you know, that's or a cat that's in the, in the family and they're going back and forth uh, across the floor and, of course, they enter their litter box, uh, you know, there's there's a good chance there could be a pathogen in there. I, always the rule of thumb is that uh, when in doubt, throw it out. You know, so that may be. It's not just a dog and cat. We walk in with our shoes from the sure. street, right? Yes, yes. Well, I, I didn't want to blame the dogs and cats. <laughs> Obviously, we, we carry a lot on our shoes as well. Let me ask you about the, the the candles question. If you blow out the candles on a birthday cake or whatever kind of cake, are you spraying the whole cake with germs? Uh, yes. Uh, short answer to that is yes. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, in our in our studies, and this is fun part too, just a little background on that, uh, we were concerned about actually the top of the cake, uh, the icing. So we created a, really a false, a faux cake, if you will. We had styrofoam and then put a layer of a sterile aluminum foil and then actually put uh, icing on there. And we use styrofoam so we could actually stick candles through the through the through the icing to simulate a party. We try to do it as real as real world, if you will, if, as we can. And actually, had the subjects eat a, a slice of pizza or take a, a bite of a slice of pizza, kind of get the saliva going, and then blow birthday candles out as if it were a birthday car party. Uh, we found, uh, and as you might guess, some of these studies we did, you find high variation from person to person. Uh, in this case. Uh, an average of 3,000, almost 3,000 bacteria are transferred to the cake versus virtually not. We had, and we ran a control, if you will. We did the exact same thing, uh, set it up with the icing and, and candles lit and everything, and just removed that without blowing on there and compared blowing on there versus not blowing on there and found, like I said, almost 3,000 bacteria on the, the cake that was blown on on average. But actually one cake, was we found 37,000 bacteria. So huge variation as you might expect and, and you can imagine a scenario we have a very young child or very we use a scenario in the book where you have a, a 90 year old grandmother or grandfather having a birthday so there's actually a lot of candles on there and then they enlist the help of their grandchildren help them blow the candles out so you're getting a lot of saliva wow. going yeah and actually actually just talking like we are now you're generating what we call bio aerosols and they are very, they are large enough compared to a bacteria, or the bacterium, a bacteria in your uh, mouth, oral bacteria, to ride along. So we're well, generating. I, I, I have to generate a bio aerosol at the moment, to, to, and to remind everybody that I'm Ira Flater. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. <laughs> So, Continue that thought, okay. please. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you can imagine then if we're just when we're just talking now, we're generating those into the air. What blow, first of all, blowing will do, and certainly you're blowing forcefully to blow candles out. You're going to be blowing oral bacteria and bioaerosols on the top of the cake and directed in that in that direction. Right. And as mentioned, Brian mentioned earlier, there are well are known some infectious diseases that are carried from saliva, uh, tuberculosis, pneumonia, flu, SARS, Legionnaire's disease. And, I'm, and again, I guess I'll step back a little bit. Uh, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but because uh, you can tell by the name of the book, we're not trying to scare people, but we are, there are some serious topics. And if someone's at, the, at a birthday party who is immunocompromised, uh, you probably want to be a little more mm. cautious of blowing the candles out and, or serving them the cake. Well, my, that was my question. After you've done all this research and you specialize in this, are you be, are you more germophobic now or less fearful? <laughs> I, I think for myself, I just Paul, uh, I'm less fearful. I mean, I, I, nothing new. Uh, and I, 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 we, as Brian said before, we lived our lives uh, 
pretty old now, I guess, and eat, eating three meals a day, you know, 365, 66 days a year. And, and sure, I, we probably all had a bout with food-borne illness, but in general, I've been very health, healthy and uh, not going to change too much what I do. I am aware of, of in public places, uh, I think I've always been aware, but a little more aware as an adult and has, has, has done some studies, washing my hands and uh, maybe not touching some surfaces before I eat and t then go, not using, not touching my face with my hands and so forth. But uh, in general, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to not eat a birthday cake because uh, someone blew the candles out. <laughs> Our number I, eight, well, uh, I've got about a minute to the break, so if you can get that in, that comment, go ahead. The only thing I have to say is that you remember when I gave the statistics, about 99% of the, of the microorganisms are, are seemingly safe to us, mm -hmm. and only about 1% uh, are problematic. So I kind of use that rule of thumb and as Paul said I like to take some caution and in, in, in cleaning my hands and what I touch at a restaurant you know menus etc right well we'll talk more about that because we have lots of phone calls and lots of tweets coming in about you know shaking hands during the holiday I'm looking at some of these fist pumping is that better than the handshake all kinds of stuff people want to know because we're going to be greeting and well how about kissing on the cheek oh, we'll, we'll get into some of the stuff after the break stay with us I'm Ira Flater. You're listening to Science Friday. We're talking uh, about the book, Did You Just Eat That? Two Scientists Explore Double Dipping, The Five-Second Rule, Other Food Myths in the Lab, with uh, Paul Dawson and Brian Sheldon. A great book. I recommend everybody get a copy of this. I want to go to a tweet that's actually close to my heart because I'm sort of guilty of doing this. It comes from Mary Kay. It says... My stepmom used to get mad at my dad for reaching into the pickle jar with his hands. He'd reply, if this can pickle a cucumber, it can pickle my germs, too. I mean, I want to know, as someone who ferments my own pickles, and I'm, I'm guilty of doing that, how right or wrong is he? I'll, this uh, is Brian. I'll, yeah. I'll take a stab at this, and okay. Paul can follow uh, it really depends upon the pickle we're talking about. We're talking about a dill pickle uh, versus a sweet pickle. The, the composition of the dill pickle is going to have much more uh, acid in it, uh, vinegar in it, not only besides you know, you know, the fermentation that occurred, but uh, it's the acid that's really controlling the microbial growth. And if we're talking about a dill pickle, you're probably going to be able to get white. And it also comes down to how dirty the... Uh, the person's hands mm -hmm. are, but for the most part, uh, the organism, most bacteria, pathogenic organisms uh, cannot resist or cannot uh, survive uh, high acid content uh, products such as uh, dill pickle juice. Is that why? So it, from that uh, is that why high, uh, ketchup can sit out forever almost because it's got a high acid in it or other condiments and they don't go bad. Yeah, uh, well, but I, basically, uh, Paul, you can take this yeah. then. Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, and even mayonnaise uh, has a has a high, high enough acidity. If you don't add other things to it, mayonnaise gets a bad name. But if it's just mayonnaise itself, it has a low uh, pH, if you will, or high acidity, and that prevents uh, bacteria. So they're shelf stable. You can kind of walk through a grocery store and see things that are what's called shelf stable that aren't refrigerated or can haven't been heated. Uh, like you mentioned, ketchup, uh, mustard, and others. So yeah, that's that's exactly yeah. why. So I, so in a picnic, in a picnic, it's not the mayonnaise that goes bad sitting out with the potato salad or the, you know, chicken salad. Well, it's a yeah. Well, Brian, can you jump in? That's right. <laughs> yeah, the potato. You've you've mixed potatoes in there or chicken in there, and that's diluted, uh, or emulsified or uh, buffered the acidity. So then it's not no longer oh. you know, the environment's no longer low enough. Uh, pH uh, to prevent growth, and you've probably, you may have inoculated the mixture with something by adding something to that salad. So I would, I'm just kind of doing this off, off the fly here in my mind, but I imagine if you did an experiment and try to mix something in with ketchup, uh, you might have the same result uh, mm -hmm. you're if you dilute out the acidity. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's move on to another topic. Uh, let me, let me, should I go to the phone? Let's say, yeah, let's, let's go to the phone. Let's go to Josh in Boston. Hi, Josh. Hello. Hi there. Go ahead. Um, so my question is about food items that may have acquired some mold on them, um, such as maybe a piece of broccoli, and there's only a small amount of mold on it. And if I was to take off that small amount of mold, is the rest of the vegetable good to eat? Mm, yeah, cheese has always has some mold growing on it somewhere when huh. you keep it around. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, this is Brian, and... Uh, 
I, again, just because you don't see it doesn't mean there's not mold spores there. Most of the microorganisms, before they reach a certain population, you can't, they're invisible, but they're there. Uh, for the most part, though, they're, they're, most molds are uh, not pathogenic to us or not toxigenic to us. Uh, I suspect that those that are growing on the food uh, are not. Uh, there are some molds, though, that uh, produce uh, toxins and aflatoxins, et cetera, that are very uh, toxic to humans. But for the most part, I would not, cons I would not presume that they would be on broccoli. And uh, but you know washing obviously or cutting off the the, the part of it. Uh, I've eaten many uh, moldy bread before because I could I could actually taste it. You couldn't see it, but you could taste the mold in there, and did perfectly fine with it. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you the uh, the question about raw cookie dough. People love raw cookie dough. Is it okay to eat raw cookie dough? Well, the F yeah the FDA and CDC are warn against that. Uh, and then I know recently there was an article uh, by a fellow from University of Michigan uh, who actually is uh, involved in the health uh, field saying that he didn't say it was okay. It just kind of had a rhyme there. If you, if you, if you really enjoy it and you're, and you're willing to take the risk, it's up to you. <laughs> but uh, the fact of the matter is there's really two parts of that dough that can be dangerous. It's the flour uh, can contain and has contained in the past found contaminated flour and uh, also the eggs if you use egg in the batter so those can contain pathogens of course they don't always contain pathogens so it's uh, as I use the analogy in the book is kind of like wearing a seat belt uh, you can eat raw cookie dough your whole life or never wear a seat belt your whole life and if you don't have an accident or don't eat run into some cookie dough that's, con that's contaminated you're going to be okay but you hit the one that is and you're mm -hmm. most likely going to get hurt so you know, if you have an op, and there's actually are some cookie doughs out there now that have they've been uh, sold on the market that actually are safe to eat raw. They're they're made without eggs, and also the heat flour the flour is heat treated. So people who like to eat raw cookie dough can can go that route if they so choose. So again, it's a matter of uh, you're taking a chance, and if you have an option that guarantees mm -hmm. you're not going to get sick, uh, I, I would not not chance it. Let me go to the phones to Adam in in Chicago. Hi, Adam. Hi, uh, this is Adam calling from Chicago, and I was wondering if it's just as dangerous to do a waterfall, like when you just pour the drink in your mouth without actually touching it, if it's just sharing it with your friends, if it's just as dangerous to do that as it is from, as it is actually like drinking the beverage from the actual bottle or cup. Okay. Brian? Or... What, what's the call? Uh, Who was I'm not it? sure well, I understood the, the well, question. I, you're, you're, not old, you're not old enough. <laughs> you're too old to understand that, actually. I think if I understand the question, he's, <laughs> if I understand the question, he's, you know, you have a water squirt water bottle, and rather than right. putting your lips on the bottle, oh. you squirt it in your mouth. And I would say if you're not contacting the the water, the, the, the bottle, and you're also, there's no chances you, the word we use is backwash. Uh, you're not contaminating the water in the bottle, so that is safer. Uh, and, and yes, sharing water bottles is highly uh, frowned upon uh, by the health industry and medical industry, and, and there's certain, actually, I was reading as part of the background that uh, the sports, some of the soccer associations in the, I think, New Zealand mm -hmm. actually has a big you know, f f problem with that. They, they have a warning of that. So uh, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's, you what, that's why you see athletes, you know, at football games, they're squirting yes. it into their mouth without touching it from the mm -hmm. bottle. Um, let's talk about the ultimate holiday raw egg food, which is eggnog. Now, if you spike the eggnog, does alcohol kill the bacteria in the eggnog? Well, it's, uh, you know, there's been some studies done, and actually I think uh, a show appeared on your show yeah. a number of years ago, a microbiologist uh, from uh, Rockefeller University. He had made a batch of eggnog, and which he had spiked with a, a salmonella a test strain, and they refrigerated this for three weeks, and they measured uh, the populations over the, that three-week period of time and saw that there was a reduction in the population and ultimately elimination of the organism after three weeks. Although I, I would say that you know the Food and Drug Administration uh, frowns upon that. They recommend that if you're going to mm -hmm. do uh, make an eggnog that's, that's spiked with alcohol, that they recommend that you start with a cooked egg base 
beginning. In other words, if the recipe has milk in it, you take half that portion of milk plus the egg and you heat it, constantly stirring up to 160 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and that should be sufficient. To, if, if salmonella is, a, is present, that you would have killed it. Then you uh, essentially allow that to refrigerate, to cool down, then you add the rest of the recipe to it, the milk, the sugar, uh, the flavorings, et cetera. And the recommendation is that you should never count on the alcohol uh, you know, actually sterilizing the product. And, and again, back to that example of that study at Rockefeller University, that was three weeks sitting in the uh, refrigerator. Who's going to make eggnog and let it sit in three weeks before they start consuming it? This is usually made, you know, a day or two before the event, and you start drinking it uh, mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah, speaking of salmonella, that, let, let me just, something that just popped into my mind that we hear all, all year, but maybe should be emphasized again in this cooking season, and that is never to wash the chicken before you use it, right? Right, that's a that's a good one. Yeah, that uh, the reason being, you can aerosolize the salmonella, spread it around the, you know, around the kitchen, the sink, the counter. Uh, it's, you're going to cook it anyway, uh, and you're going to destroy. If cooked properly, you'll destroy all the pathogens mm -hmm. or salmonella on that product. So, by washing it, you're not really giving yourself any advantage. And secondly, you there's a good chance you're spreading it around uh, the kitchen. Yeah. Let me go to the phones. Let's go to Amy in Manhattan. Hi, Amy. Hi. Hi there. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, hey. Amy, are you there? Sorry. Then, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm having a problem with my uh, my earphone. Um, yeah, I was wondering on the um, the double dipping. Uh, suppose you hold a um, hold your your chip or whatever you're dipping in the middle, and you dip each end. You know, dip one end, bite it off, and then. At the other end without moving your fingers. Is that uh, does that make it safe? Well, yeah, except you're actually your hands now are, are what's uh, contaminated. <laughs> so you're not you're not getting oral bacteria. That's, that's a, a good way to avoid the oral bacteria. But uh, hmm. yeah, so I I guess the hands are a real a real a concern of way bacteria is transferred as well. But yeah, that's that's a way to avoid that. And I'm I'm glad you asked that question because the one thing, kind of one of the interesting things we found out in the double dipping was we actually used we tested salsa, chocolate and cheese dip and found there was more transfer to the salsa, than there was to the cheese, uh, and chocolate. And we thought about this because it's a thinner dip, it's so more is falling back in there. Uh, and r relative to the dill, the pickle question. Actually, the salsa, we, we let the dip stand, sit there two hours, and actually saw a reduction in the number of bacteria in the salsa, but it was still there. So uh, I guess to add on to the, the dill pickle question, it depends on how long in contact uh, the bacteria is with the acidic environment. And even after two hours in the salsa, which is pretty low pH, it still wasn't gone. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Merritt from uh, Vail, Colorado. Hi, welcome to Science Friday. Hi, happy holidays. I love your show. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question for your expert um, based on a secret I've kept for years and years. Um, my family always had really large Thanksgiving dinners, um, tons of people around, and in the hustle and bustle of cleanup, my uncle put together a plate of just leftover scraps, a few things, took it outside, and let his dogs have it brought the plate back in, put it on the kitchen counter, and there was one lone piece of asparagus that the dog didn't eat. And my grandmother, who hadn't seen this, walked by, picked up the asparagus, and ate it. Um, none of us ever told her. <laughs> He's no longer with us. Um, the asparagus has nothing to do with that. But, but, um, but I was just wondering kind of what your expert's take on that was, that she just ate this asparagus. And, you know, in general, we have... Lots of cats and dogs around. People do all kinds of things that I think are kind of gross, feeding the dogs from the table, letting the cats walk around. So I just wondered about, you know, the introduction of pets into the oh. mix. Be before we get that answer, let me remind, uh, remind everybody, because it's going to be a long answer, I think. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. Talking uh, with Paul Dawson and Brian Sheldon, authors of Did You Just Eat That? And uh, go ahead. Who wants to jump in on that one? Well, I'll I hope the asparagus. Okay, I, I hope asparagus didn't have anything to do with the passing of the <laughs> relative. <laughs> Well, let's well, assume it hasn't. <laughs> okay. No, I I suspect it hasn't, and I go back to the the original scenario that uh, and Paula actually mentioned it that we we eat 
you know, 365 days a year, three day, three meals a day if we're lucky, and we don't always get sick. And we have animals and pets, and you know, we eat in, we eat out, and uh, but then again, uh, there is a risk associated with this. So uh, again, dogs and cats they right. may appear to be clean. Uh, obviously, they don't ha- they don't wash their hands, they don't uh, their, or their feet, their paws, and so consequently, there's a greater risk that uh, the organisms that they have on their paws or in their mouth are those things that they've picked up elsewhere that could very well be containing you know, pathogens. You know, there is a risk associated with it. Uh, uh, how great that risk is, you know, I don't think any of us know. It, you, you could calculate something like that, but I suspect that there still be small. But I would never, uh, and, and the animal can be a clear, appear to be clean. The surface can appear to be clean, but it's, you know, it has microorganisms on it. And it's just a matter, are they, are they pathogenic in nature? Let me go to Richard in Fort Myers, Florida, because he has a question I have at least half a dozen people asking. Go ahead, Richard. Yes, uh, I have a question regarding toddlers. And, uh, you know, little kids in general are running around, dropping food, picking up food, seeing something that they like, put it in their mouth, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, along with that, I'm wondering if that doesn't help them to build an immunity uh, to me- organisms that may exist in that environment. Let me get an answer to that. You know, with all these toddlers, they're crawling on their four limbs or they're standing up, they're picking up the food. Is this good? Should we stop them from doing this? Well, you probably can't stop them, <laughs> uh, first of all. And, and certainly it does help the immune system. Uh, and there's a lot of, as Brian mentioned early on, I think about the microbiome, uh, there is a lot of research that. The, micro, the bacteria in our body and, and other microorganisms are very important to our health. They, well, that's been well known, but there's a little more uh, being explored in that area. And certain, certainly exposure to uh, bacteria and viruses mm-hmm. at a young age helps build the immune system. Uh, and I guess the caveat to that would be uh, we all ex- uh, as adults experience it, and now we have a strong immune systems. There are there are some things that overwhelm the immune system in some cases and certainly don't want to risk exposure to that. But, uh, yeah, a quick answer to that is yes, it certainly does, I would say. All right. We've, we have run out of time. So much to talk about. I want to thank both of you, Paul Dawson, a professor of food science at Clemson, Brian Sheldon, professor emeritus at uh, North Carolina State University in Raleigh, and authors of the book, Did You Just Eat That? Did you just eat? <laughs> That's a great book. Uh, you can read an excerpt from the book on our website at sciencefriday.com. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great holiday. Before we go, I want to take a minute and thank all of Science Friday's donors and people supporting their local stations with gifts. Individual contributions are a large part of public radio success. And if you haven't made your end of year donation, please consider doing that. So, you know, public radio needs your support. It's a great last thing of the year to do. Charles Berkowitz is our director, senior producer, Christopher Taliata. Our producers are Alexa Lim, Christy Taylor, Katie Heiler. Technical engineering help from Rich Kim, Sarah Fishman, and Kevin Wolf. We're active all week on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the social media. And once again, if you want to read an excerpt from the book, we talked about Did You Just Eat That? Two scientists explored double dipping, the five second rule, other food myths in the lab. You can read an excerpt on our website at Science Friday.